Hi, my name is Julia Zadkar, and I am a senior equine industry and management student here at the University of New Hampshire. And today I want to talk about coat colors and genetics in the horse. Here is the breakdown of today's video. We're going to start off with a review from part one, which you can also find on YouTube, done by my partner Maria. I want to clarify a couple of things for you before we move on to the concepts of melanin and pigment. We are then going to move on to the dilution genes and the genes for white patterning. And we are going to finish off with talking about some of the health implications that some of these genetics have. Before we get started, I want to put a general disclaimer out there. My goal is to explain to you some of the foundational concepts behind coat colors and genetics, hopefully in an easy to understand way. But by no means can this video explain every possibility out there. There is just way too much. And with any horse, to be 100% sure of what color they actually are, you will have to do some genetic testing. Coat colors can look similar and start to blend together on the spectrum. Or maybe a horse has more than one gene being expressed at the same time. And some of the names for the coats that I'm going to use here today might be different than the coats um, you're used to hearing. All right, let's remember some of our terms and definitions from part one. Remember, genes are what give individuals their traits or the things that make them unique, in this case, coat color. And genes usually have two versions of themselves called alleles. And those alleles are responsible for the genetic variation that those individuals are expressing. Also, remember that homozygous means two of the same and heterozygous means different. And also remember that Alleles can be dominant or recessive. Or if it helps you, think of it like this, um, capital or lowercase. Now let's recall some of those alleles behind the basic coat colors that Maria has introduced us to. Remember that black needs at least one dominant E, and they must be homozygous recessive for A. They, on the other hand, must be they're homozygous dominant for A or heterozygous, and they also must have at least one dominant E. The reasoning behind the E and the A combinations is due to the A allele. The A actually stands for agouti, and what this does is it takes all of the black that the horse has and pushes it to the points, like the mane, the tail, and the legs. Next, remember that chestnut is homozygous recessive for E, and the chestnut will be red. And lastly, our gray has to have at least one dominant G. And I want to clarify something, something here. Um, let's use gray as our example. So what happens when you have a homozygous recessive G? That doesn't code for gray, right? Well, what does it code for? And actually, each coat color has a formula to it, depending on what alleles that horse has. If you look at their genetic formula, their other alleles will tell you what they should be. So for example, we have a horse that is not gray, um, maybe you pick Bay off the list, there's other alleles E and A are present, and that will tell you what he is. I also want to use gray as another example and to clarify one more thing for you. And now we all know the grays are not all the same, and grays have their own special patterning. They are all gray genetically, but depending on what kind of coat they have or what kind of patterning or shading maybe, they might have different genes being expressed. Their, their age actually comes into play with gray. Remember that horses aren't born gray, but they gray over time. And it is also thought that coat condition or nutritional condition can also affect some of the gray patterning like dappling. But of course, all of this depends on the individual horse and what is going on. All right, now let's move on to our topic. Now, what do genes actually code for? What do they do? The genes we're talking about today code for melanin or the pigment that gives hair and skin its color. There are two main types. Theomelanin, which gives us our reds and our yellows, and eumelanin, which gives us our blacks and our browns. And other genes can come into play here too. Some other genes don't necessarily affect the color or the intensity of the pigment, but rather if there is pigment there or not. And let's understand that melanin comes from melanocytes, or the cells in the body that make melanin. And they aren't always present all over the body. If the horse has colored hair or skin, there are melanocytes there. If the horse does not, and the hair is truly white, and the skin is truly pink, and that horse does not have melanocytes there, there is not pigment there. And horses can have areas of both. All right, next, let's jump into dilutions. 
So what's a dilution and how does it work? Basically, a dilution causes a loss of pigment or it dilutes the pigment in the melanocytes, effectively lightening the coat. They usually work in copies of one or two. The main dilution genes I want to talk about today are cream, silver, champagne, pearl, and dun. And I want to instill something very important in you. Remember that a horse with a diluted coat, no matter the shade or how light they may be, still has melanin in that coat. They are not unpigmented. Let's talk about this cream diagram for a little bit. Cream is usually abbreviated C or CCR, and dilutes our red and brown pigments. And simply put, our chestnut with one copy of cream is going to be a palomino, and with two copies of cream will become a cremello. Our bay, on the other hand, will become a buckskin with one copy of cream, and a perlino with two copies of cream. Sometimes the cremellos and perlinos can look a little bit similar, but for one, cremellos are usually born with blue eyes, and secondly, the perlino usually keeps a little bit of a copperish tinge in his mane and tail. Next, we have our silver dilution, abbreviated as Z, and sometimes also referred to as the silver dapple dilution. And what this does is dilutes the black pigment, usually to a chocolatey kind of color in the body and a silvery color in the mane and the tail. Dappling is also usually seen in these horses. And I would like to point out that I am using UNH Coco here in the picture for our silver dilution, as previously introduced to us by Maria. And I also want to clarify this misconception that um, silver dapple is not a gray dapple. Next, we have champagne, and champagne can be kind of interesting, um, usually abbreviated as CH, and you only need one copy of it for it to work. Two copies usually doesn't make a marked difference. Champagne lightens the base color and gives you these kind of golden or shimmery horses that you see here. Black becomes classic, bay becomes amber, and chestnut becomes gold. Pearl is next on our list, usually abbreviated PRL. You can have one or two copies. One copy will produce golden undertones in the black, the bay, and the chestnut. And actually, a chestnut with two copies of pearl will give you this creamy, shiny, pearly kind of color here. Lastly, we have done abbreviated D. And what Don does is dilute the eumelanin and pheomelanin on the body. Don leaves distinct points, and the Don trademark is the dorsal stripe along the back. Occasionally, you might see striping on the legs. And here, our black becomes our mouse done on the left, our bay becomes our yellow done in the middle, and our chestnut becomes our red done on the right. And remember that the red done will have a red dorsal stripe. All right, with dilutions out of the way, let's start with some white patterning. There are many factors and genes out there at play for white patterning, but let's start off with the paint. There are two genes large, largely um, responsible for the patterning in paints. One is Tobiano, abbreviated TO, and the other is Oviro, abbreviated O. And the difference is Tobiano generally refers to horses who have white over their top line and generally mostly white legs. And Oviro, Oviro horses have dark over their top line and darkish legs. Remember that our formulas still apply. And on the left, we have a Bay Tobiano. Remember, he's got, he has the, um, the E and the A. So all of his black is being pushed to the points. And on top of that, he's Tobiano, which gives him his white patterning. And on the right, we have our Chestnut Oviro. Remember, he's Chestnut and he doesn't have any black. He doesn't have any dominant E's. And he has the Oviro gene. Now, sometimes paints can have a wide variety of coloration and those that aren't strictly Tobiano or, or Oviro might be referred to as Toviro. So for example, this horse on the left has white over his top line, but he has mostly dark legs. Or this horse on the right has dark over his top line, but white legs. Next, I'd like to talk about Sabino, or abbreviated SB1. Sabino horses generally have a mostly solid body, but they can have white on their legs, their faces, or their bellies. Sabino also doesn't have to be strictly a paint horse gene. Multiple breeds of horses can have this. And some breeds of horses can have Sabino coloring, but no genuine Sabino gene. They have something else. For example, this Clydesdale on the right 
may look like he has Stabino patterning, but he does not carry the real Stabino gene. Next, we have the Appaloosa, or the Leopard Complex Spotting Gene, abbreviated LP. And yes, this patterning is in Appaloosas, but can also be in other breeds too. But this gives us our characteristic spotted leopard, um, white, blan white blanket, hips, um, roaning, and modeling, and those kinds of horses. You generally know an Appaloosa when you see one, probably. Some Appaloosas also have roaning mixed in, or roaning can be a thing all by itself, too. And what roaning is, is white hair mixed with color, whatever color horse that might be. And it can be throughout the whole body, or it can be on parts of the body. The horse in the middle has some spotting going on and roaning on the front half of his body. And the horse on the left is fully roan. That horse is actually a blue roan, which is black and white hair mix. The horse on the very right is a red roan with a day with white. And if you have a chestnut roan with roan, you have chestnut and white hair, you'll get a strawberry roan. All right, now we talked about uh, white patterning, but what about actual white horses? White horses are generally very, very rare or not truly white at all. There are horses out there who might have a dominant W allele, um, but that does not guarantee purity, and chances are they have some color somewhere on them. So near white is um, more likely the word to describe them. And some even say there's no such thing as a true white horse. And remember that some coats may look white, but they're actually not. Remember, our grays will be gray no matter how white they look. And our cream dilutions are still cream dilutions no matter how white they look, especially our cremellos. There is a possibility, however, that horses with a double copy of SB1 or Sabino are all white, or nearly all white. Now, what about albinos? Traditionally, albinism is defined as a complete lack of melanin in the body. And this means that an animal will display truly unpigmented white hair, truly unpigmented pink skin, and red eyes. There is no such thing as a red-eyed horse, and therefore there's no such thing as a true, true albino horse. All right, let's switch gears and talk about some of the health concerns. Let's start off with our whites and our lights, or our pink-skinned or peachy-skinned or pale horses. Because they have a lack of melanin or they don't have very much of it, they are more prone to sunburning in certain areas. Uh, melanin, one of melanin's jobs is to block out UV rays from the sun, and the darker the melanin, the better. You can put sunscreen on your horse or offer them a fly mask or shade during turnout to help with that. Next, some of our horses who have white patches on their face or their head or especially around the ears, they might be partially or fully deaf. There is a connection there. Let's jump over to ovarian lethal white syndrome, otherwise known as a double copy of the ovaro gene. This is a picture of an ovaro foal that has just been born. This is not a picture of a dead foal. And these foals are born with an underdeveloped um, digestive tract. They cannot defecate, which will lead to megacolon and colic, and they will perish. These foals are usually euthanized to prevent the suffering. Also note that an ovaro lethal white foal is born all white. Next, we have melanomas, especially prevalent in our gray horses. Now, these are little cancerous bubbles or nodules, and I want to express to you that they're not as fatal as human cancer usually. They can be benign, um, they can be moderate, and some uh, can be more serious and they can metastasize to other parts of the body. But they are highly manageable, and a horse can still live a pretty long life. These are usually found on the tail or dock area, around the anus or the genitals, or the mouth and the lips. It is a very good idea to regularly look over your gray horses and to know your horse is normal and what is not, what is new, what is old. And you need to have an ongoing management plan and conversation with your veterinarian. Next up, we have congenital stationary night blindness, or otherwise known as having a double copy of the leopard complex spotting. Again, usually associated with our Appaloosa horses. These horses have impaired ocular function, and essentially, they can't see in the dark. They are fine during the day and in light, though. And lastly, did you know that some horses are born purple? And as exciting and cool as that sounds, it's really not. These are called lavender foals. 
and they are born with impaired nerve function to the point where they cannot stand or nurse, and they will also perish. They may also be born a pale gray or pewter color or very light, light chestnut. This wraps up my video for today, and I highly encourage you to stay updated and do some research of your own. I did not cover everything, and there's so much more out there. Here are some pictures and words to maybe give you an idea of where to start. Also keep in mind that the research is ongoing and the information changes over time. Please keep yourselves updated. And I am so glad you tuned into Virtual Equine Education Week. And I really hope you learned something. Keep a lookout for my additional resources. Thank you.